to begin. <laughs> I was just, All right. I was to get myself in the mood. I was just listening to the Venga Boys. And uh, are you familiar with their work? And no, I, I know the name, but I'm not familiar with the work. Really? You don't know? No. Boom, boom, boom. We're gonna double boom. I thought you were and gonna like, say boom, boom, boom. Come back to my room. No, no, that's a common misconception. <laughs> uh, and, and there's also the Venga Bus is coming. Uh, well, how did you? What? Who? Who listens to this? I, I don't know. I feel how, like you're. What? I feel like you're in the pit bull crowd. Like that's a pit bull band. Wow. No, not even close. Uh, really? I think they're from the night. I don't even know. This is so ignorant. But uh, they're like party music, basically. Oh, right. They have a song oh, that they're going to Ibiza or Ibiza. Ibiza. And, uh, so they're they're happy guys. But my whole story will be lost on you but i was just <laughs> going to say that i was reminded of one time working on a movie the last day i was so depressed just walking through the woods in the rain and i was listening to the venga boys and i was texting my friend and she was like this is probably the most depressed anyone's ever been while listening to the venga boys <laughs> <laughs> so you pretty much if you're listening to the venga boys depression's unheard of <laughs> i guess that's the lesson we can take from this So, Arrow Video, you were the guy who suggested it to me. Yes, that's correct. Um, do you know? Wait, are we starting here? Wait, yeah. wait, wait. That was all okay. getting. That was all getting recorded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, I was saying that to the listeners. <laughs> Hello to you as well. So I'm Eddie D, joined here by my co-host, Rusty. Hello. And uh, in this podcast, The Archers of Horror, we are going to review and discuss every Arrow horror film. That is correct. There's a lot of Arrow films, so we'll be busy for a while. Yeah, and there is a lot of shit. There's a lot of shit to get through. And... Uh, Arrow has like been called the criterion of shit movies. You know, they're kind of like <laughs> they do nice versions of movies, and sometimes it's like whenever Criterion does something, it's usually pretty legit. Arrow definitely has some things that you're like, is it the art or is this actually a good movie? Yeah, well, will we be uh, revisiting some of those terrible films that we've already watched? If it's an Arrow horror film, <laughs> our fans expect us to watch it and discuss it on this show. Oh boy. Oh boy, that's I mean, gonna be tough. Oh my god, I, I just watched the initiation a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, I'd have to watch that again. Fuck. <laughs> well, uh, Hell comes to Frogtown and Hellgate are two that ring a bell off the top of my head. Arrow, a little background on Arrow. I've never Googled them. Don't know anything about them. Uh, <laughs> they are a British company. I do know that. But you, you're the guy who got me into Arrow. I was resistant for a long time, which you wouldn't think because. I'm very into wasting money on movie related items. <laughs> yes, and I mean if the artwork on the sleeves don't sell it, then I don't know what will because that's certainly drew me in. Oh yeah. I mean they have amazing art and it really it I think it makes a podcast like this interesting because sometimes the art can trick you. And is something like the stuff actually a good movie or does it just look cool because the cover is kind of awesome? It's it's entertaining, so definitely worth a watch. Oh yeah, no, I'm excited to watch this stuff. That was actually a bad mm -hmm. example because I've always liked Larry Cohen and his work, and uh, seems like a really good guy. Okay, so, but our movie today is Blood Rage. We're going with Blood Rage, not many of the other titles. Yes, we're going with Blood Rage, okay. and I really don't know how obscure of a movie this is, but it seems like it's pretty obscure. Yeah, I never heard of it until you uh, told me to purchase it. So yeah, and it's currently available on Amazon Prime. And I'm not ready to get into discussing the actual movie yet, but I'll just say <laughs> it's fucking great. <laughs> it I, is great. Yeah. Would you, Would you say it's uh, Blood Rage is all the rage? I would say that. That's exactly <laughs> what I would That's say. The slogan. That's the slogan. Blood Rage is a slasher movie, but it was released at the very end of the golden era of the slasher, which Wikipedia tells me was 1978 to 1984. And uh, I think it's a really interesting commentary on the genre itself. But before we get into that, I'm just curious about your personal history with the slasher. Like 
I, I, I've never known if you're into slashers or not. Sorry, my lisp is insane. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Will that be edited out? <laughs> no, that's staying. That's staying. okay. Good. <laughs> um, my personal, I mean, obviously, growing up, I've seen pretty much all of them as a young kid. When I, you know, most of those films are either are R-rated or not really appropriate for a small child, but my parents didn't care. They just let uh, me watch whatever I wanted. Yeah, exactly. My parents didn't give a shit. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean... Like, what was, like, the first thing you remember seeing? Um, the first slasher film that I distinctly remember would be, of course, Halloween, which... Really? That's your first one you remember? Yeah, but I saw that when I was, like, four years old in, like, 19... 19- what 84 uh i guess so if you want to take two years off your age for the podcast sake (laughs) well i was very young but yeah i mean they they would play that every year around halloween and Mm -hmm. i wasn't really aware of halloween um until i was a little older i mean like by a little older i mean like 13 and you're talking about the movie not the holiday (laughs) yeah yeah, i was aware of i was actually for like in first grade not first grade, fifth grade. I was the Aztec god <laughs> Quetzalcoatl. I'm not sure how to say it, but uh, that was a pretty shitty costume. It was just like Dracula meets, meets an Indian. And uh, I've had bad costumes ever since. I remember being the guy but, from Balloon Fight. No one got that. Uh, the guy from Fight? From Balloon Fight. Well, you're really the character from Balloon Fight, a very obscure early black box Nintendo game? Yes, I was. <laughs> what did that costume – what could that costume possibly look like? Did he uh, just wear like a red jumpsuit? Yeah, it was just like uh, coveralls and a balloon taped to you and uh, a helmet. Mm-hmm. And that was about it. Did you come up with that on your own day or did your mom just like – No, this was when I was like 35. <laughs> So I, I wasn't really aware of Halloween for some reason until I was a little older, but I was very aware of Nightmare on Elm Street, which was definitely the one I was into the most. But and did you see it from the beginning with the first one, or did you skip I did. My- I did. I, I, I actually saw the third one first. Which yeah, was- that's a common. That, that's a common yeah. one to go first. I remember so. seeing the first one and just being like, wow, that's so cool. Like... <laughs> The part when the mother explained, like, we burned him. I, I was like, wow, this is like the part where they explain the Ark and Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> I do know uh, it was probably like the last movie that scared. Like, I was way too old to be scared at that movie. And I was like the whole, you know, the uh, the kid, the puppet guy. Oh, yeah. Like, when he was made into like a marionette. That, <laughs> that stuck with me for some reason. The whole Freddy rhyme. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> What a spooky song. But I remember, like, I I couldn't appreciate Friday the 13th until I was way older. Um, Do you appreciate it now, though? Yeah, actually, I I enjoy those movies now. What was, like, the first more obscure slasher film that you saw? Do you remember? Uh, It was Blood Rage last week. (laughs) Um... (laughs) You know, you know what uh, slasher film? I guess I'm going to call it a slasher film um, that I saw at a very young age that I loved. What? Like, uh, Black Christmas. Oh, I still have never seen that, believe it or not. Oh, I love that movie. I wish that was an Arrow film. And it actually holds up really. Like, really? To watch it now, yeah. And the guy that in 2001, A Space Odyssey, David Bowman. Uh, oh, yeah. Real... Care Delay. Care Delay, yeah. He's, he's in that. I... And. Uh, just to interject really quick, also Olivia Hussey. Olivia Hussey, who uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Oh my God. But Kier Delay, <laughs> uh, my old professor Nita Foch, who is like a Academy Award nominated actress, uh, she said about Kier Delay, she's like, we had a saying about Kier Delay. <laughs> Kier Delay gone tomorrow. <laughs> That's. I like Care Delay too, but too. Yeah. yeah. I was really into those Roger Ebert books. Like before the internet, that's how I would like find out about movies, like the Roger Ebert books and the Leonard Malton guide. And Roger Ebert was very anti slasher to a point where it made me think that slasher movies were like really anti 
intellectual or something and I shouldn't like them. Yes, he really uh, took uh, Roger Ebert's words as gospel, so he did That's... avoid certain things. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> uh, give me another example of that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I did, though. Now, we go to see these films in movie theaters. These are not the kinds of movies where they have nice private little screenings <laughs> for the critics. And to sit there surrounded by people who are identifying not with the victim, but with the attacker, with the killer, who are cheering these killers on, is a very scary experience. Um, all right, so our first okay. film from Arrow is Blood Rage. And we're going to alternate who picks what, and this was my pick, and... I'm glad that you liked it. I was a little worried you, you might like. What did you make of this when you first saw it? Because I've seen it now like five times. I, I've I've seen it twice, and I watched some of the commentary. But um, I mean, it definitely has all the elements of a classic slasher film. Yeah. But it does it well, and obviously, the music really sets the tone and pace of the film. But I, I mean, some things were predictable. I mean, I, the ending. When we get to that, it was pretty predictable. Yeah. But I, I, I enjoyed the ride, even though at times the acting was a little shaky. Wow. You it was a little shaky. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get this film at all. Oh, um, I got the film. <laughs> I, I mean, that's it, true that it contains all those elements, but I feel like this movie is like a piece of outsider art that should like hang in a gallery. Oh, yeah. I mean, at times I definitely felt like it was almost a spoof on – Slasher films. Oh, yeah. I, I wondered if it was supposed to be. Uh, but then after consuming all of the special features, I think I could confirm <laughs> that this is outsider art and uh, was kind of unintentional. It seems kind of like what happened with this movie is the director was just like a hack that they randomly got. Um, the producer was like tough producer who seemed really cool in the in the extra features, I think. Wasn't one of the producers also the star of the film? Uh, no, not the, the star, but the doctor? Yeah, she plays a psychiatrist. Uh, okay. Is Marianne that the same producer you're Cantor. talking about? Yeah. Okay. And uh, it, it's funny, in her extra features, she talks – like she seems like very practical, like wanting to make money producer, which I always like enjoy that character. Um, <laughs> and she was like, I think the title's great. Blood Rage. It's got a lot of blood. <laughs> it's got a lot of rage. Watch this film. You're going to like it. Um. Quick and to the point. Yeah. <laughs> and, can you say? and so they got Louise Lasser and she wanted to get away from comedy and saw this as a chance to do a dramatic role. And <laughs> so she like, as a result, does this like really over the top reaction to everything that then becomes comedy again anyway. <laughs> and so that's why her scenes seem like they were filmed by aliens. <laughs> that's a, uh, I really wondered what happened because it almost seems like she didn't look at the script before accepting the part. Oh yeah. There was some story about, uh, she was improvising and the director either stopped shooting or got mad and she tried to strangle him. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Yeah. That was, I think Ed French in the, in the okay. documentary features, Ed French who did the makeup for this film. He had, Phenomenal. uh, Yeah. That was uh, actually one of the highlights is the makeup. Oh, it's by actually far. better than the props. So <laughs> the prop guy. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the prop gun in this movie is really funny because it seems like one day they had a really shitty looking gun and then they must have been like, we got to get a better gun. And then because there's a few scenes where the gun looks real. Yeah. That, it, it, yeah. I, I noticed that. I actually wrote that down in my notes. And uh, but yeah, Ed French did the makeup of this. He also worked on Chud and mm -hmm. uh he got an Oscar nomination for Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Also mm -hmm. did T2. T2, yes. I saw that. And recently Wait, can won we an hold, Emmy for Westworld. Can we hold on one second? I'm sorry. Yeah. I just spilled water. I just spilled water all over the floor. No, this is good. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, this, but, is, yeah. this is staying in. Let me just get a paper towel. Hold on. I'll be back in a second. Okay. First of all, I mean, the first thing you are struck by in this movie is that the music and the opening credits are awesome. I believe the composer was Richard Einhorn. Yeah. Um, what else did he do? I, I know he did The um, Prowler. One of our favorite shockwaves. Oh, yeah. That was his first movie. Yes. 
I mean, <laughs> this is a movie about a twin who is. It's like the reverse of your typical slasher movie. It's actually the reverse of your typical slasher movie in pretty much every way. Um, but it's about an escaped sane person from an asylum who is coming home for Thanksgiving. Although Thanksgiving is very incidental. But coming, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because they really seem like they wanted it to be a Thanksgiving slasher but barely committed. Yeah. I mean there's a few elements that say Thanksgiving but – other than that, you wouldn't really have any idea. Yeah. And so it's about this twin. He's coming back. In the first scene, we see that his brother is a killer, but he falsely places the blame for the murder on him in a, in a very <laughs> strange moment. Well, as <laughs> the funny thing is, as he's setting up his twin brother, there was people already kind of gathering around. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they had to see, like, what, why is that kid wiping blood on that other kid? Yeah. Oh, because I can murder. But he wipe he wipes the blood of the other kid, hands him the axe, and then Louise Lasser comes running up, and she runs up to Terry, the kid who just framed the brother, and is like, "Terry, Terry, are you okay? Are you okay? What's going on?" Without noticing the other brother who's bloody, which is a very obvious. <laughs> it's like a you know, it was clearly an intentional choice, mm-hmm. um, but you just know when that moment happens that you're watching an interesting film. I mean, uh, if we go back to the very beginning, uh, from where the movie starts off, if we could go back to yeah. the opening scene, where we're in 1974, 10 years before present day. Yeah. And we see the drive-in. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, it's supposed to be 70s, but it doesn't look that <laughs> all that 70s. Yeah. Uh, except for they made like a couple people look like hippies. Oh yeah, I mean the movie theater. You're talking about like the opening montage. That, that feels I'm about the opening montage. It feels yes. so eighties. It's like it's <laughs> crazy that they weren't trying to do that. <laughs> but even like the, the the two people that were when they showed the different couples, you know, making out because mm-hmm. I guess that's what you did at a drive-in uh, movie I theater. That's but what I did. <laughs> it's what I wanted to do. That's what I really believed my life would be as a kid oh. watching movies like that. I don't know what I thought my life would be. I thought my I thought that's how life was going to turn out, like hanging out at the movie theater, like getting some condoms from a guy selling them in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, Ted Raimi appears as the condom salesman. <laughs> Ted Raimi is, of course, Sam Raimi's uh, son. And uh, really, no, he's his brother. <laughs> that's the joke. I was like, "What's not going to laugh?" It's ruining my joke. The first time I saw that scene, I thought it was really crazy. And now I've come to think it's one of the more sane moments of the film. <laughs> Did, I've never heard of that before. Have you ever gone anywhere where there's some weird dude lurking in a bathroom with a, a pocket full of condoms that he's selling? I used to do that. That's what I did <laughs> up till a few months ago. <laughs> well, when he opens his uh, jacket up to show his merchandise, uh, the guy's like scanning through him and he's just like, oh, I like those. Yeah. And. He, he, <laughs> doesn't matter at that point you're at a movie theater <laughs> yeah he's like he's a pretty discriminating customer for a guy buying it from a dude in the bathroom he's, he's looking at the con- trojan that's good she kind of nah that's nah <laughs> um oh wait so but back to i i like the way you were summing up the plot of the opening scene because <laughs> we see the first couple and then we see another couple and then we get to Louise Lasser and the guy <laughs> who are just like, what the fuck am I watching now? Like mm-hmm. they're both like so much older than <laughs> anyone else. And they've got the kids, two twins asleep in the back. And the guy, cool. the guy is like, come on, come on, let's get it on. And she's like, the, the, the kids. And he's like, oh, don't worry about them. <laughs> well, the funny thing that stood out to me was that it, uh, it was the, how old are the twins? Is there, are they seven or eight? Uh, at, at least. Yeah. And the fact that it's like an R-rated film and that they're taking their two kids to an R-rated film with, with you know, what the guy wanted to obviously fool around, like, you know, I, I thought that was a little comical. Yeah, I mean, an R-rated film is really nothing compared to you're going to fuck in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my dad took me to see the Emerald Forest, but he wasn't banging my mom in front of me. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Just make this awkward for the relatives listening. Um, Wait, yeah, we we got to take a step back though. Okay. 
because when they pan to the kids, the twins sleeping in the trunk of the station wagon. Yeah. There's an assault rifle on the blanket that they're sleeping. <laughs> That's a toy, though, I think. Is it a toy? It looks like a pretty realistic. Uh, that looked like a more realistic uh, gun than the guns they actually used. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> what a weird place to spend their real gun prop. So we start with an opening kill and we get the idea that the wrong twin has been sent to an asylum. The next yeah. scene is a voiceover from the psychiatrist, which, <laughs> which is very bizarre. Very bizarre. I mean, it's very uncommon in a movie to have a, a non-essential character have a voiceover and just be for like one scene. <laughs> and it suddenly feels like some industrial film that we would watch, like a teacher would roll a projector into a classroom in 1987. And like, this would be like on a film <laughs> we're watching. Dr. Berman's patient consultation notes, November 22nd, 1984. Saw Maddie Simmons. Todd's mother for the first time today. Can we also clear up that um, Luis Lasser's character's name is Maddie Simmons, and the oh, kids yeah. are Todd and Terry. Yeah. So we know. Oh, just yeah. so the audience knows who we're talking to. Yeah. We're talking about, I mean. Yeah. We have a lot of, uh, you know, bumps to get over here in our first episode. <laughs> so. so, yeah. Uh, to take a step back, Todd is the good twin who's been falsely sent to an asylum. Terry is the evil twin who's been living among us. A normal, very normal life. For the he's li- living years. a very normal life. Uh, well, I don't want to jump over the second scene. So, uh, Can we say why he started murdering or why he murdered the guy at the drive-in movie theater 10 years before? Or should we hold off on that? Uh, I don't what remember. set him into his rage? Wait, what did send him into his rage? Um, I think the intimacy of his mom and the guy, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, completely. That's the theme of like what later comes to be his um, psychotic episode. <laughs> but I mean, this is definitely the most Freudian of all slashers, and they're probably <laughs> already pretty Freudian, but I don't know much about psychology. Um, I mean, there's a million things as the movie goes on about how Terry just wants to fuck his mother and like has no other sexual feelings at all. Uh, I mean, that's all very strange stuff. But he got to that that A to B, uh, which is true. But they never really set that up that he wanted to fuck his mother. Like, uh, there's, they don't show anything. I mean, in the scene at Thanksgiving is the only idea you get that like he's protective or desires his mom when they announce their engagement. Yeah, but we'll, we'll get to that in yeah. a second. I mean, I mean, but are, are you saying that's the only part that has that because? It's all over the film. Or do you mean up till this point? I, I think that's the most blatant reference to it. The other things are a little more subtle, wouldn't you say? Well, some are subtle, like how he is always drinking milk. But yeah. some are more blatant, like how when the mom thinks she's talking to Terry and she's drunk, she tries to make out with him. And uh, <laughs> That is true. <laughs> okay. Um I mean, Ter- Terry's palpable jealousy from a- anyone who, like, what sends him into his second blood rage is seeing his mother in the mirror making out with the guy who's going to be the new husband. Mm-hmm. But this is, uh, it's so hard to sum up the plot of this film. You were doing a good job. S- set us up here. Take us through the first few scenes. Of when we are now in 1984? Yeah, now in the present day. Uh, well, I, I think... Something that has to be touched upon is when we are finally introduced to uh, Todd as an adult. Yeah. Oh and they, my God. They bring... <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this is like one of the most classic moments in cinema. No, the, the, the acting's phenomenal because he <laughs> completely oh, portrays a catatonic um, a mental patient. I mean, I uh, unironically think that Mark Soper, who plays this double performance, is like, that's an amazing performance. He's really good in this movie. He, he, he is phenomenal as a dual performance. I mean, you really think it's like just with a little bit of a hair difference and a difference in <laughs> posture. I always, I'm like, wow, that's a different actor. <laughs> it's two different like psychoses. Like uh, one, he's catatonic. One, he's psychotic. Yeah, that's true. But, I, but I really like the Like the messy quaff that they gave him. Oh yeah. It's the, like, Oh yeah, this guy's life is completely like messed up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give him some messy hair. Um, all right, so in, in you were saying when he's first introduced and the mother is bringing him his annual pumpkin pie, <laughs> which I, I 
basically the ther- there's a voiceover from the therapist that explains the entire jump in the plot that Todd is innocent and he's been trying to explain to her that he's innocent. And Louise Lasser comes to visit and she doesn't accept his uh, tale of innocence. What are you crazy? And then what does he do? Um, well, as his uh, life is crumbling, he's crumbling some pumpkin pie in his hand. Yeah, and then he's throwing it against the wall. <laughs> and the therapist's re- reaction shots to all of this are just like completely uh, inscrutable. You're just like, what, what is she thinking? <laughs> and when Todd is trying to explain that Terry is the murderer, she like is looking at the mom like so satisfied. It's like, there you go. There you go. Terry's the killer. She's so calm. Out of the dramatic nature of today's outburst, I considered the setback relatively minor because Todd remained focused on establishing his innocence and getting on with a normal life. Get me out of here. I never killed anybody. So then we go straight from this scene, which now like, okay, the opening scene was weird. The second scene becomes very strange. And then the third scene opens with like the fakest game of football that's ever been played. All right, you rush. I'm going to cover Karen. Yeah, the, the fact that there's like eight people in that scene and they were all huddled together, I guess, you know, for <laughs> framing purposes that they had to be there. But yeah, I mean, if anybody has ever played football, that they would not do any of what we were just saying there in yeah. that scene. Which then, uh, what happens in that scene? Um, we What's learned that? that Terry's a cool guy, oh, that for yeah. 10 years he's just been living like a typical like teen life, that he's like a heartthrob because obviously. Karen's his girlfriend's into him, but I, think I got you. But we are introduced to Andrea, who's jogging by, and yes, she immediately yes. takes interest in him. Yeah, and uh, what's his original girlfriend's name? Karen. Karen. He he's got no sexual interest in Karen at all. He gets there. He does get there, but he only gets there. I don't remember exactly why. Well, I'll edit that part out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so then we go from the world's fakest football game. In the next scene, which is the Thanksgiving dinner, right? Yeah, that's why it seemed like there was a more of a jump than an afternoon to dinner. It yeah. Like. <laughs> because at the dinner, we have Karen, the girlfriend, and Andrea now, and her mom. Yeah. And now we're meeting um, Luis Lasser, Maddie's uh, boyfriend, Brad. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, so some characters. And... Um, that's when Brad and Maddie inter- uh, announced their engagement. Yeah. They announced their engagement and <laughs> Terry is clearly not pleased at all. And I believe – Well, you just have to – he almost did like the what face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where he looks at like the camera almost and gives like a double take. Like <laughs> if he had water in his mouth or a drink, it would have been spit uh, out. Yeah, that would have been a spit take for sure. Uh so he first he has that shock, and then does the call from the asylum come right after that announcement? Yeah, the mother leaves the room to take the call. And she gets the call that Todd has escaped from the asylum. Mm-hmm. And she calls Terry and the husband, the future husband, into the kitchen, right? To tell them that Todd escaped, but not to tell anybody. But I think she actually – does she do that? Because I don't think they left the, the kitchen table, did they? I think they do because then okay. she's like, don't tell anybody. And then they go back and Terry immediately announces to everyone <laughs> – well, That's you're going you're gonna to get to meet my psychotic brother, Todd. He just escaped <laughs> from the asylum. <laughs> Looks like you're going to get a chance to meet the rest of the family. My psychotic brother just escaped. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he does that, Louise Lasser's character starts eating this bun behind him and looking like <laughs> she has like the most mortified look on her face for like 45 seconds as she just kind of crumples this <laughs> bun and <laughs> – it's just another amazing moment in this movie. What was the direction that they gave her in that scene? Or did she just... Oh, uh... She clearly was just doing what she wanted to do. And <laughs> she made the right choice. Every choice she makes in this movie is the correct choice. But it's also insane. She she definitely becomes unraveled pretty instantly. Like Oh, yeah. I mean, upon like hearing that the other brother is coming, she begins like a cycle of compulsive eating and drunk dialogue. <laughs> what? What memory do I want? Get me my boyfriend. No, please get me my boyfriend. (laughs) 
<laughs> the drunk dialing is pretty funny. I mean, that scene reminded me of the uh, Albert Brooks scene from Modern Romance. Is that which one it is? I'm not an Albert Brooks expert. Well, one of the first scenes we get is she's sitting on the floor in front of her refrigerator eating leftovers. Yeah, that was so good. But uh, to go back a second to the um, Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. Um, you have to think it was weird when uh, Terry wanted to toast the engagement and he has his glass of milk with Thanksgiving dinner, which I don't know what psycho would ever drink milk with Thanksgiving it's because, dinner. It's because he's like so into his mom. That's why he only drinks milk. <laughs> well, he drank the tomato juice in the other scene. Well, that's weird too. <laughs> All right. So one thing I'd like to touch on quickly is um, when uh, they find out that Todd is loose from the institution. Yeah. Is, oh, but I'm sure you have an answer for this. Maybe it's in the commentary. Why does the why does Maddie always refer to it as school? Is it because she, she's ashamed of uh, Todd, or she just act, doesn't even acknowledge really Todd's existence, or doesn't want to acknowledge Todd? I completely miss that. She because she says like, oh, I mean, she calls it. She refers to it school that he escaped from school. Oh. Unless, unless maybe she was a little, little sauce while uh, filming this and just no, assumed I, the institution I, I think, in school. I think school must have been. Uh, I, I feel like Louise Lasser's character is like one of my relatives. Like she's like one of my aunts or something. And if it's like if someone went to prison or something, you would never say they were in prison. You would just say they're away or, you mm-hmm. know, that's what school was to her. Okay, that makes sense. Um. So. So then Brad, when they find out that uh, Todd's loose and he could be heading towards the complex, uh, Brad, the, the fiancé, says, uh, don't worry, he'll handle everything. We'll handle it. Then doesn't he try to, like, have sex with Maddie? Like, aren't they in a room? He's like, come on, let's do it. And she's like, <laughs> "She's like, my crazy son just escaped. I'm worried. He's like, oh, don't worry about that. Come on. He's probably hiding in the closet back at school. and then terry of course comes up and sees this and this is kind of the last thing he needs to push him over the edge to start killing people well well, the thing is terry's set off at that point but before he's going to start murdering people he goes into like the bathroom or no his room i think and he starts uh, putting some mousse in his hair now can we just talk about his hair for a second oh big time (laughs) losing hair is never fun I know I'm, I'm looking at uh, one of the <laughs> monitors is off and I'm looking at myself in the reflection <laughs> and I look so bald. <laughs> I'm going to be old in like six months. So I really got to <laughs> nail down my life. Well, what kind of light? You got to get some uh, dark lighting in there. Well, I'm just going to spray paint my scalp <laughs> brown. <laughs> but now, Mark Soper is supposed to be a, a 17, 18 year old. Yeah. And and he's got some serious uh, receding going on. But, and then, like I said, I was watching this with my uh, fiance, and the first time I watched it, and she's like, uh, we both looked at each other and was like, oh, he, he, we want to see what he looks like now. He's obviously bald. And I was shocked. Did you, saw, did you watch the interview yeah. with him? No, his hair seems like it's basically the same. It held up exactly the same. And, Unbelievable. Hats off to, <laughs> Hats Mark, off to Sober, Mark Sober, who's got nothing to hide under a hat, so he should he, take his hat off. He, he aged incredibly well. Yeah, and is great in this film. He is great in this he film. He also, in, in that special feature, like, it was interesting watching the special features of this movie, just to jump completely to that for a second, because each person seemed to have a different perception of the film, and they were closer and closer to the truth. <laughs> and I think Mark Soper was the closest to the truth about this movie, that it's amazing. Uh, Louise Lasser was like coming around. She was like saying how she didn't really think it was interesting. And then she'd watched it like the night before. And she was like, I think it's actually interesting. And uh, the director is just clueless. <laughs> and yeah. But it, 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 Ed, it, Ed French it was like, oh, I think it's like a pretty fun movie. And he's like, and the stuff Louise does just makes it interesting. Everyone in the special features seems to be noticing that this is like a very interesting movie. Yeah, I'm surprised it's not bigger than it actually is. I think it's like, going to get huge. Like, I really think this is going to become like a defining cult movie. 
which is why we really got to nail this episode. It, it's, it, I don't even think it's considered at this point a midnight movie. Oh, no. I don't think many people know about this movie at all. Like, I think just the hour release is kind of the first real release it's got. Like, I think it came out on VHS, we said, in, in you know. 87? 87. Well, it came out theatrically in 87. But when did it come out? It would... Well, it seems like it was barely in theaters. So it probably was like this. Let's just guess it was the same year, even though things were way <laughs> different back then. Remember how long sure. it used to take things to get to video? And sure. especially with like time being longer when you were a kid, the combination <laughs> of those two things made it insane. We got to address the um, introduction of Dr. Berman and Jackie, who I still don't know who he is exactly. Oh. But th- there's a knock on the door of uh, the Simmons household mm-hmm. or on the uh, apartment door, and Terry answers it and immediately has a gun to his throat. <laughs> this is such so, a strange scene. It's like, okay, keep going. So, so, you, <laughs> so the psychiatrist just, shows up. At Thanksgiving dinner, right? Or is it later that night? Um, it's a little later. I, I don't know if the guests are still there. So later, but, uh, later that night, the psychiatrist shows up, and she's got – what's his name? Jackie. Jackie. Who Who's is, probably either her son or an assistant. Oh, yeah. I think he's an assistant. Okay. And he's got a gun. And Yeah. He, I mean he just – I, I think he would have pulled that gun on anybody that answered the door. Yeah, he definitely would have. <laughs> but uh, and and th- then Doctor Berman comes because she was probably sitting, you know, standing off to the sidewalk just watching. And she comes mm-hmm. rushing in and says, "You know, that's not Todd. That's the twin." And then she's just like, "Wait, you're you're Terry, right?" Yeah. So so, <laughs> so she's assuming that it's the wrong person, but not sure. Yeah, and but she also and, believes that Terry is a murderer, so she's remarkably casual to this guy. <laughs> she want to blow her cover yeah um yeah but so then the, she took the gun away from jackie right yeah basically yeah, right, later no i think she took the gun away from him then and she explains that the gun which i think is like a luger is only uh a tranquilizer gun yes um but the crazy thing is that louise lasser arrives upon this you know fairly far into this exchange and then she <laughs> notices the gun like 10 seconds after arriving and goes, what's that gun? <laughs> yes, I did. Dr. Burke, did you find him? No, I haven't even looked yet. What's that gun? <laughs> I mean, it's just another really crazy moment. It's always, it's impossible to describe how like weird these moments of this film are, but it's just every scene has the one moment where you're just like, who made this? <laughs> so we're, so we're, where are we? We're at with the Jackie and Dr. Berman being the introduction of them. Yeah. And uh, I think this is where we see Brad suddenly the party talks to them and then says, oh, he has to go to his office. It's Thanksgiving at like 11 p.m. <laughs> yes. This is a demanding job. Mm-hmm. Is he the first kill? He is the first kill. Uh, yeah. Terry shows up mm-hmm. and uh, he's got a machete. But but he cl- clearly has a machete. He's holding it in front of him, and Brad oh. says, "Look what the cat brought in." <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about this movie, by far one of the interesting things, is that Terry doesn't have a mask, and we always know Terry is the killer, and he just shows up in his kill scene so casually. He's like, "Hey." <laughs> And then he's got like a huge machete and then like slashes somebody. <laughs> and it gives everything a really another uh, – just a strange quality. So after Brad is murdered, we're, we're back to Jackie walking around the complex looking for Todd. And it's uh, – I think it was filmed on like some nature walk thing that uh... – Yeah, the, I think University of Jacksonville. Oh, yeah. And that was a cool location. That really gave everything like a weird feel. Now, the crazy thing I, – I mentioned this to you, but um, – as a kid, as like a, my parents owned a, a, a condo in Jacksonville, and I'm actually kind of familiar with that nature walk. I've definitely walked on it really? before. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I definitely like the the condo complex that my parents owned looked very familiar to the one that they shot at, but it, it was not the same one. Oh, I was I was hoping for it to be. But they looked like watching it. I kept saying like 
I, I think this could be it. I think it might be the same place. Oh, but God. Uh, it's, it's not. I never knew that your parents owned a condo in Jacksonville back then. It was good times. <laughs> what, did you did you go down there a lot? Um, every every Easter we went down there, and it, it, it was definitely those awkward teen years. I'm sure you remember well. Mm, not really. But uh, you don't remember your awkward teen years, or my no, <laughs> you don't my, remember my awkward teen years. My DIY lobotomy took care of that. <laughs> but yeah, we went there every year, and um. Interesting enough, that was like right on the cusp of puberty. I like what I'm hearing. So, so of course, uh, this is this is gonna be a crazy tangent, but I mean, crazy. Um, uh, what's it called? Edit this for me. Yeah, I will. Uh, what am I trying to say? There was a girl. There was there was like okay. Let me get back on track. So the complex, like how like it was owned by families but it was like also uh, did like seasonal renting so you got people from all over the country that would stay there so it was like kind of interesting like the, the pool area at night was like a melting pot for people to come together and talk and whatever and of course at that age being uh on the cusp of puberty like there was girls that were there and obviously older than maybe and way out of my league at that age but um they I wouldn't say showed interest, but they definitely um, talked to me in a, like a overly friendly manner, which I, you know, mistook as being flirtatious. You're just rubbing up against the side of the pool as you're talking. <laughs> well, it was in a jacuzzi, so you had uh. the jacuzzi, and oh boy, like you know, like at that age, you can imagine. I but, can't wait. Go on. <laughs> Well, I was thinking like this is this. I'm I'm now entering the dating world. This is it. <laughs> this is uh, what the big boys do. <laughs> Little did I know there was a, a lot of problems going on as a 13 year old or a 12 year old. Wait, what do you mean by problems? Well, like personal hygiene wasn't <laughs> like I didn't really comb my hair all that much. Oh. Do you remember like this is going back to maybe 1990? Do you remember when like lines in your hair was like the in thing? Oh yeah. Like the faded lines, yeah. Like and like the more lines you had, the 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 more lines you had, the cooler you were. I didn't know that. I have to go back in time (laughs) and get more lines. Like two was like you know you you could hang, but three, you 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 were dating the cheerleaders. Uh, Yeah, I had like six. (laughs) Well, I had three going around my whole head. Yeah. So from like the side around the back of your head, and you know, but. I think I don't know if I did it myself or the barber was just an, one of those old time Italian barbers. <laughs> they were the most crooked lines anybody. Was <laughs> like I didn't like buzz the side of my hair. Like I didn't have like that undercut kind of thing. So yeah. like it was like longer hair, like eighties hair with lines. Just, it looked. <laughs> it looked I love like I love these uh, old Italian barbers we had on Long Island, like in the eighties, and they were like eighty, and like coming to them with like eighties style. All of a sudden, they're born like in Sicily, like at the start of the century no matter what picture you brought in you, you were getting the same haircut yeah as like, whatever you want that everyone else got I'm like brian bosworth this is easy <laughs> Did that's the haircut you wanted no i mean i, I wanted successfully spiked hair which i never had <laughs> i wanted like that lo- like lost boys hair like marco or uh the the, the other guy in the lost boys the the, the, the black hair with the earrings i, I guess they are, i don't but, remember yeah. But anyway, so here I'm at the pool with bad lines. I don't know if I had the lines still, probably, but a bad hair. Like, I had perpetually chap lips for some reason. I, I didn't know what chapstick was, I guess. Yeah, I had that. I had uh, braces. Just like, you know, like a dweeby kid. I was wearing, like, Michael Jordan and Bono's clothing with, like, sneakers, like, like you know, like, size 11 for, like, a 12-year-old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course like you know talking to these girls and and they're like you know which i'm perceiving as flirtations and then my older brother and my cousin who were like surfer guys and skateboarders come in and immediately like go off with them and i was just left there with like some like old guy from texas (laughs) getting back to the film basically it's the story of todd is coming home Terry is killing people. 
And he's doing so in, you know, quite a over the top gross manner. Like for instance, the psychiatrist gets bisected mm-hmm. and then Todd later comes upon this body and tries to unite the pieces and is very, he, very half-assed. Very half. <laughs> very he, he knows, in his, to his credit, he knows that that's not going to put the body back <laughs> together. Um, but he yells at the doctor, the dead doctor. He's like, why didn't you believe me? Which is funny. Cause I was like, this is the only time in a movie I've ever seen someone be angry at like a body that's been cut in half. Mm-hmm. <laughs> why didn't you do something? So after, after the Dr. Berman uh, murder scene, yeah, we get the famous line that I think they so desperately wanted to be a uh, catchphrase or a slogan for the film. They, of, they definitely wanted to. Yeah. But it's very forced. It, it, well, it was so forced that they did it four more times. Yes. <laughs> so let's hear, but, let's uh, hear that line. Terry, 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 Terry's clothes now are soaked with blood. Yeah. And he decides, which he obviously knows what is on his shirt. He, um, dabs his finger on it, the substance, which is blood, put, licks it and says, it's not cranberry sauce. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the yeah. Catch, that's the slogan of Blood Rage. It's not cranberry sauce. Yeah. They, it's not cranberry they, sauce. It's, there's so many other lines that are, like I think, quotable. And like, I mean, I'm Todd kind of ends up being the big line for me. But... Uh, <laughs> What yeah. was the fifty times they said that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's not cranberry sauce. Like the the way that they're forcing that, it almost seems like a kids in the hall sketch or something. That isn't cranberry sauce, Artie. That is not cranberry sauce. Yeah, I, I was thinking like the state. If you remember the state where like I dip my balls in it. Yeah, exactly. So I was thinking that. I'm sure not many people are going to know that reference. But no, they might. Okay. I'll keep it in. <laughs> keep it in for the yeah, fans. No, we'll keep it in for the fans. Um, so then so, moving on to the – keep going. Well, I don't know about you, but at this point, he, Terry showers and uh, changes into a new set of clothes. Mm-hmm. And, and at this point, I was just hoping like, okay, the murders, the murdering's done. We could we could go home now. No. But, but, it's, but it's not. No, Terry's, <laughs> we're we're going to get more. Terry's not done. He is not done. He just needed a change of clothes and some more moose in his hair. And this is where he changes to his shirt with the white stripe, right? This is a pretty – this is the iconic outfit. This is what every bad boy wore in the 80s. It was that kind of shirt. Yeah, I remember wearing it. <laughs> uh, he, uh, I, I almost think that there could have been like a franchise, a Blood Rage franchise with like evil <laughs> twins, you know, that dimension to a slasher movie. And this would have been his like Freddy Krueger outfit. I think I, I think I almost gave it the comic book treatment as a kid. I think I wrote that comic book. Oh, really? I like it. I... Well, it's called the, it was called the Evil Twins. It's same. It's the same plot. Well, I had a comic called Teddy Defender about a teddy bear, <laughs> a teddy bear who had seen too much violence in the projects and became alive, and he killed uh, drug dealers and stuff. I'm not saying this is like you know, it's problematic for sure. It was a social commentary for the time of 1980. It was. It It felt, (laughs) as an eight-year-old, it felt appropriate. As an eight-year-old in suburbia, it was very appropriate. (laughs) It was just like uh, my later political cartoons about the uh, about Desert Storm. (laughs) I don't stand by these either. Oh my gosh, where were we? Um, <laughs> we're talking about Terry's snazzy outfit. I don't know what how, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> holding on for dear life here, people. All right. It's not cranberry sauce, Artie. It's not cranberry sauce. Okay, but anyway, so at this point, Terry's Terry decides to um, go pay a visit to Andrea, which for some reason he knows she's babysitting. Did was that ever mentioned? I'm just going to guess it probably was. Hopefully, uh, I am not sure. I think she might have mentioned it during the football game. Okay, wow. <laughs> movies all over the place. But it, it, she's ready and waiting for him, and um, she invites him in, asks him if he wants a drink, I believe, and he settles on the tomato juice. Just tomato juice. Sure. I don't drink. And then uh, they're talking about college briefly, and she's majoring in partying. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
And she wants to get the party started, if you know what I mean. She wants right. to get down. Yes. And what does Terry do? Wants to watch some TV. Yeah, he does not want to have sex. He clearly, I mean, I mean, this girl's throwing herself at him. It's also funny that he, uh, when he t- mentions that he doesn't drink, he's it's like, he's like, I don't drink, as if implying that something bad had happened when he had drank at one point. And it's like, this guy's a mass murderer, sober. What could have happened <laughs> that compelled him to quit drinking? See, at first I thought they were going for like the like the Puritan thing mm-hmm. that like sex is bad and drinking is bad, but like he does smoke a little bit of pot. Yeah, yeah. So, so he picks and chooses. I think that that's the movie's kind of predictive of the future because there's a lot of people in today's day and age who don't drink but smoke weed. You know? Yeah. So Terry's kind so of a cool guy. Revolutionary, a very revolutionary idea. You're high, aren't you? <laughs> you always get real quiet when you're high. So as Terry and uh, Andrea are doing their thing, in a weirder scene, we get um, Todd lurking around the complex, Mm -hmm. and um, Karen approaches him thinking that's Todd. I mean, thinking it's Terry. (laughs) Okay, keep going. And she approaches um, Todd and starts making conversation. I don't know if you remember any of the dialogue. Well, but- she, I believe, comes up to him and is like, listen, Terry, <laughs> I think we should have sex. <laughs> and Terry is like, I've never kissed a girl. Yes. <laughs> See, Todd is, a, Todd is shown as having sexual interest in girls. Yes. Oh, he, he, he was all about that kiss. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't know how to handle it. <laughs> but, so... She obviously realizes, um, I guess there's a giveaway by that line, that uh, it's not Terry. Yeah. She's like, oh, you're Todd. Oh, my God. Okay, sorry. I, I was just looking at something. Uh, this is an amazing moment. You you keep going. Sorry. Are you playing you. it? Well, Terry, come on. I wish you'd say something. I'm not Terry. I'm Todd. Um... Terry's brother? Oh my god. I mean, um, so you're home for the holidays, huh? She reacts so strangely where she's like, oh god, but she acts like it's awkward, not like it's like lethal. (laughs) You seem nice. I've never kissed a girl before. Oh yeah, well, um, you really ought to try it sometime. I gotta go. Bye. So we're back to seeing Andrea and uh, Terry in the apartment, and she's still trying to seduce Terry, and in walks uh, the owner of the apartment, uh, Julie, mm-hmm. and her very, very uptight boyfriend, who played by Ed French. Yes, in a in a huge cameo. Huge cameo. <laughs> very unlikable character. Mm-hmm. Kind of an awkward nerd. Yeah, she's trying but, to get a rich husband. This is a little subplot. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, she obviously has a young, very young child which is probably an infant i would assume <laughs> this is our introduction to the baby which is in this film for no reason <laughs> for it's a very it's strange it's a really strange presence of this baby because you would think okay so there's a baby in the slasher movie i think at one point terry is is terry ever going to kill the baby it seems like he doesn't even look at it no i, I don't think they would go that far um it would be <laughs> so it's a really incidental baby but it's kind of an interesting mm thing overall because it it, it oh, i can't even explain this uh okay so back to you back to you well because the baby here's what i couldn't say the baby is uh, beautiful like, <laughs> the baby's awesome the baby's so fun uh the baby okay we'll you're see. coming apart at the seams he's coming apart i know but i gotta try to land this plane <laughs> andrea, you need okay, andrea is the is the good girlfriend character right andrea uh she, you know, Karen's a good girlfriend. Oh, Andrea's Karen, like okay. the, the the girl that just came back and yeah, like the, the, the loose girl, clearly. the seductress. Um, the <laughs> uh, so okay, listen up. Karen yes. wants to have sex with Terry, and she says it to him in such a plainly reproductive way that mm-hmm. she is like the wife figure. She wants oh, a baby. Yeah. She ends up with a baby. This movie is all about replacement. Todd mm-hmm. is coming home hoping to replace Terry. Terry is feeling like he's going to be replaced by the fiance. And how did I forget the biggest thing? 
the fact that it takes place on Thanksgiving. You missed one also. You, you, actually, that's a great point because you actually are missing one too where um, Atari or whatever system they were playing, yeah. the, uh, the two guys, Artie and Greg, is the replacement for uh, sex. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, and uh killing it. <laughs> I, I uh that that scene of them playing the video game and ignoring the girls is really unrealistic to modern eyes because you're just like that game looks like shit. <laughs> I I know you probably know this. I, I was trying to figure out what game that was. It looks like a really bad outrun or something. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out at all. I I, I was totally torn because I was like, it looked so the movie was filmed in eighty three. Like at one moment the graphics just looked too good, but then I was like, "But there's no way that they created a game just for this movie." Yeah. So it must have been like Atari Fifty Two Hundred. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, Atari, even Atari Fifty Two Hundred, like pole position looked worse. So I, I don't think they had that kind of level of graphics. Yeah. But maybe it was a uh, Atari Seventy Eight Hundred. <laughs> this seemed like the kind of movie where maybe they would record with a vcr like a video game from another film like cloak and dagger <laughs> and then play it on the vcr and just be like i hope we don't get sued <laughs> but these guys were so like into it dagger reference. and they were they were uh, yeah. wrestling with their controllers like tony soprano playing mario kart <laughs> i think in the scene when karen starts playing um it, it, she's she's playing a long one it's and, and so is uh gregor Artie. And it's clearly like a one-player game. So it's like, how are they both playing this? Uh, the power of imagination, <laughs> as, as Muppet Babies once tried to teach us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the, there's that scene. And just basically, I, I mean, we can, I think, jump through the plot a little bit, right? What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, we see the nerd guy. Obviously, we know he gets uh, killed. Which, ter- yeah. for some reason, Terry returns to the apartment. Um. Yeah, Terry comes back and kills that nerd guy, and then and we later see his severed head. I like when Todd breaks into. Let's talk about Todd breaking into his apartment. Oh my god! Or his parents, or I guess his this was mom's a very apartment. weird moment on the commentary, as I'll point out in a second. Go go on. And he goes into his into I guess Terry's room, or maybe it was his old room at one time. And there are some interesting things. I'm sure you noticed the one inside the room. Oh, uh, my pet monster? <laughs> you wish. The, the Yoda mask? Oh, that's weird. I don't think I did notice that. It's like the Yoda mask from like E.T.? It was like the Yoda mask from E.T., yes. Oh, wow. And I thought for sure you would definitely pick that up. But also there's a machete on the shelf, and I was just thought, is, does, does Terry have two machetes, or was that the one he was carrying around with him, and he put it back in his room for a little bit? No, I mean, I typically, if you're doing like a bunch of machete killings, you should put it back <laughs> on the shelf. You clean it, put it back on the shelf, and then you get it again 10 minutes later. It's kind of a routine. And we also see the placement of that assault rifle from when he was a kid, when uh, from that back seat or from yeah. the side of the station wagon. So my thing was, um, he's got a machete on the shelf, a uh, assault rifle, toy, whether or not you're thinking it's a toy. But some signs have got to be there. Won't his mom <laughs> cleaning his her son's room see a machete? <laughs> and and but, so, okay, so maybe, but, maybe it is. Maybe Todd is innocent. <laughs> <laughs> um. So then, but Todd, after this, after coming in the room, he picks up a baseball glove and kind mm-hmm. of looks at it. Right. Yes. What did you think that moment meant? Like, what was happening? Just on a basic uh, level. I thought it was this. Uh, more of a reflection on his youth. What, what, what was the symbolism there? Like, well, I, 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 that's what I thought too, just that he was looking back on the youth he could have had, but didn't have. Yeah. Because it also kind of looked like a kid's room, except for the machete and the M16. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I think there's some choose your own adventure books on the shelf as oh, well. Oh, that's cool. Like the white ones. <laughs> yeah. The, the uh, white I ones. Yes. Like it. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. on the commentary, the director says that in that moment, he's, seeing the life that he's missing out on. And I'm like, but that's Terry is like now of the age where he's like having sex with people or at least people are trying to have sex with him. And the room looks like the room of like a seven year old. (laughs) So I would also take that maybe like Todd, um, we realize that he's not fully developed at that point because he does 
take the baseball glove. Yeah, that's true. But Todd wants yeah, to have sex. That's true. Wow. I mean, I was a young kid. When I was in, like, second grade, I wanted sex, even though I had no idea what sex was. Wow. Well, I wish <laughs> I wish I could say the same. Yeah, so Things you, would be they, so much more normal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's clearly insane that uh, Terry, who is a very cool guy, has a room like a seven-year-old. Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, I think it was just lazy on the props department. Like, we're not we're not decorating a room twice here. <laughs> yeah, they, and it was like they only had like one corner of that room to work with. They're like, okay, you can put that bed up against that wall. Put a baseball glove and a machete on the bookcase. <laughs> the Yoda, I can't believe you didn't spot the Yoda mask. I think I probably did, but I probably forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> so. So now, <laughs> now it's coming up is one of my. F- Favorite scene, but in an unintentional way. Yes. Um, when uh, Andrea and Greg are fooling around, mm-hmm. do you remember? And the other two are playing. Um, I don't know what system that is. It wasn't Atari, but whatever. Yeah. And they're in the bedroom and they're fooling around. Mm-hmm. And then we go from where Karen's like, "Hey, I wonder what those guys are up to." And then we hear a scream. Yeah. And they go into the room and, um. Andrea's face is all uh, battered and she appears dead. Yeah. And <laughs> and then we realize that they're that uh, Greg and Andrea are playing a joke on them to yeah. scare them. This was a weird I think because slashers have become prominent, like movie makeup effects appear in a lot of slashers of like the later period, like Friday the Friday thirteenth part four and this film. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> Now they, where was this? What decision was made that they were fooling around and they said, "Wait, let's hold off. Let's let's put some uh, let's put um, makeup on." Yeah, classic applications classic. and prosthetics on. But the thing, I mean, you obviously know you're in the business that 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 takes a really long amount of time to do. But do you remember, like, as a kid, like when you would come up with a crazy idea for a Halloween costume, like something really gory, and you'd go oh, to yeah. like Melly the, the, Grams and get yeah, like, like spirit gum and uh, you get like this thick scar and the blood and the tissue. Oh, yeah. and the sinew oh no, and all that, that, that makeup. The, that makeup it definitely takes hours to do, and th- that's right. The idea that they were getting ready <laughs> to have sex, and then they were like, "Wait a second, let's now, you said that was- do several hours of movie makeup." <laughs> now you said that was a really shitty game that you probably couldn't play for more than 10 minutes so in, in a span of like 10 minutes they went from fooling around to doing that kind of makeup i mean that's something to aspire to <laughs> do you remember like buying that stuff and like just being like oh my i'm gonna be so uh, gory like people are gonna freak out when they see me oh and then my god you just get like a jumbled mess of brown colors from the mixing of all the other colors. I remember, <laughs> like, I, re- I remember getting blood capsules and putting them in my mouth, and then trying to fake like I fell down the stairs to my grandmother, who <laughs> was just Edward? like, "Edward, what are you, what are you doing?" <laughs> like even she wasn't fooled. <laughs> so anyway, so from after they scare their friends, they uh, Andrea decides. Um, she wants to really play tennis at like midnight at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we do get a really cool scene with the, the tennis court. Oh yeah. The tennis court is one of the coolest scenes. Like it, it looks so cool at night and it's uh, yeah, that's the, that's the best aesthetic. The, scene. I mean, there was really something peaceful once like they lost the ball and Andrea went looking for it. And uh, uh, what's his name? Greg is just laying on the floor in the court. Yeah. So it's like, Oh, that's, that's what I want to do. Exactly. I spend a half hour of my time on the floor. And then um, Greg is horned up at that point. Yeah. And makes his move and Andrew's like, not here. Let's, I got a much better place. Which takes us to the, the diving board fucking. Oh, this is a great. This looks really, it actually kind of looks, dare I say, it actually looks kind of sexy. <laughs> Something about it. Describe sexy to me and that's what you're getting. <laughs> yeah, that basically is. Um, and then when Terry oh. approached, this kill is pretty uh, unique. <laughs> oh, he he walks in and what does he say? 
Um, oh, he says something to the effect of like, that's bad or that's wrong or something puritanical about the sex, I believe. You stop that. Oh, oh yeah. Something. He says, stop that. And then he and then- says something like, that's bad on the shot of like the diving board. There, there's a shot where his lines kind of eaten up by the soundtrack. But then he says, uh, you're bad, Greg. Bad. Yeah. So he's almost like reverting back to, um, you know, an adolescent state with that. Yeah. Well, he finds any expression of sexuality except for towards his mother to be offensive. The, the kill, the slashing with the machete is actually brutal because you could almost picture that in like a live league video. Oh yeah, he, it's that that whole kill is done like in one shot from kind of like further away than slashers usually, you know, wider angle than they usually have, and so yeah. you just see him walk up and just slash them both, and uh, yeah. it's a very effective moment. Yeah, that would have scared me as a kid. Yeah, it definitely would have scared me too as an adult, especially since my dad had a machete just like that. So. <laughs> I did not know that. I always, I always <laughs> wanted a machete. I still kind of do. I'm like, oh, if I had a machete, I just feel secure all the time. I could walk around the apartment with it. It'd be like a peep show when they walk around with the gun. That'd be me and the machete. So Karen is now confronted by Terry that he is clearly crazy and is going to kill her. Yeah. But at one point, they, they start to get intimate and were interrupted. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> look, look at your goddamn notes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so zoned out right now. I'm so zoned out right now. <laughs> this room, I think, is like 100 degrees. So I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> this is how I'm going to find that you perish. Like, you're just like going crazy. You're eat, <laughs> eating fucking mussels. You're like, you're going to start eating the dirt, the soil from your house plant. <laughs> he was dehydrated. He went crazy. Oh, my God. He couldn't find the exit. He was so delirious. I <laughs> get out of this room. I wish I wasn't looking at this reflection of myself in the monitor right now. I look. It's like the picture of Dorian Gray. I look so old. <laughs> you like sweat. You worked in a sweat, so your hair is like completely gone. I, <laughs> yeah, I really do. I really do. You know what's worse though? I, I mean, this won't be in here, but. Um... When you look at your hair from like your your front view and it like looks okay and you're like okay my hair looks good and then like you catch like a profile view and you're just like oh my god you can see like scalp all the way oh my god I uh, there's one like really high mirror on this construction site near me <laughs> and sometimes I walk by it and I just capture I capture a glimpse of like the very like the top part of my head like the you know whatever it's called where all the hair comes from <laughs> the crown. The crown? And uh, I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize that was a problem area, but that's totally receding too. <laughs> Thanks for this fucking mirror city of Los Angeles. And it, I mean, I, I noticed dressing room mirrors are brutal. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I smash every one I get in. <laughs> I, that's why I have to order all my clothes online. I've been banned from all the stores. Well, I, that's probably part of the reason why I do order my clothes online. It's just like, I don't, I can't bear to look at myself in another one of these mirrors. Oh my God. And they're like, what, what lighting should we have? Like, Oh, let's get the lighting from the asylum Todd was in. <laughs> oh man. You know, well, the good news is we have about, a, I have a page left. Of All right. Go this keep podcast. going. It's hard to know how much of the I don't plot know. we're going to keep in. Like, I feel like, but let's keep going. Okay, ready? Yeah. At this point, uh, Karen finds out that uh, Terry's actually the murderer. Mm -hmm. He's completely psychotic and plans on killing her. Oh, yeah. And and the way that she discovers – the way that his murder is discovered is that he like just start – casually starts to try to kill her. And she's like, oh, shit, and runs away. She runs away, but as she's running away, he takes like the weirdest baseball swing at her with a machete. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But so she's running away, and she. We come back to the the little girl. She knocks on the door of the little girl. Yeah, the little girl has lost earlier. Todd has 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 told to stay inside and not open the door for anybody. Mm-hmm. So she actually takes his advice. Yeah, of a of a weird guy that she just meets in the woods. And doesn't she have the cat with her at this point? 
And she's like, you'll hurt my kitty. Implying that she has found the cat. Yes. That's true. After me, you to hurt me. You're going to hurt my kitty. Oh, God. So she leaves the apartment. She finds Brad's uh, body, which is a great effect with the head, uh, with Brad's head hitting the, the desk that he was slumped on and splitting open. Oh, yeah. That's one of the best. I think that's probably the best gore moment of the movie. Yeah. And the way that Louise Lasser approaches, we see that he's brutally dead, but she's approaching him for quite some time in like the same shot, just being like, Brad, Brad, listen, why are you ignoring me? <laughs> so we go back to uh, Karen fleeing uh, Terry, which somehow um, she grabs the baby, that pointless baby that's in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so like, the Clement, uh, why can't I solve the, now? I'm losing wait, hold it. On. I'll, I'll, I'll lead. Okay, uh, lead. And then, so the climax of the movie, did the climax of the movie also remind you, as it did me, of It Follows? It all takes place like in a pool house of like this yeah. apartment complex. It really felt like It Follows. And uh, only in the fact that there's a pool in the scene. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the climax is insane. I mean, I'm not sure how much we should describe of it, except to say that Todd and Terry finally confront each other and fight. And each time it's the double for either Todd or Terry. I can't say that it looks that great. <laughs> they, the fact that they, they slap the gray wig on. They, <laughs> on Todd. The hair color is wrong. The guy's body is like, he's about like a hundred pounds heavier. Really and uh, yeah, so it, it, it looks but, funny. Yeah. <laughs> they, they got like a, like a, like a wrestler, like a wrestler yeah. type body. <laughs> Like and a so barrel-chested guy. <laughs> they end up fighting, and uh, they both fall into the pool. And then a really weird thing happens where it's such a bizarre choice for when Louise Lasser comes in for Karen to be saying to Todd, like, to she's clearly identifying which one of them is Todd. And yeah, well, Louise Lasser completely ignores that and then shoots Terry. Twice. Twice. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> But then when she realizes that she's killed the wrong one and Todd is like, I'm Todd, I'm not Terry. She First of all, she gives like a very romantic speech to Terry. Very heartfelt to speech, Todd, yeah, yeah. Like, we don't need anybody else. We didn't need to be with each other, that's all. Oh, God, he's such a good boy. He's such a good boy. He's the best. He's the best. Like, he's actually thinking, like, shit, I got my mom back. Everything yeah. is cool. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, he's like, I'm I'm not Terry. I'm Todd. And she <laughs> she says, I'm Todd about a million times and then blows her brains out. <laughs> and we end on a freeze frame of Todd looking traumatized. <laughs> he's lost everything but yeah i mean the the amount of i'm todd you get it's i'm todd a lot. is repeated at the end of this film probably like 50 times which just makes the climax of this movie really weird i did like that she killed herself like oh yeah i mean uh, I, I couldn't imagine like I, that's why i'm saying the ending was a little like um, obvious like i couldn't imagine it ending any other way like obviously terry was going to get killed and most likely the mom was going to either kill terry or get killed in the process and it was that she killed terry and then killed herself yeah i mean the thing is the ending of this movie is completely predictable it's what exactly was going to happen the whole time but it does it in such a strange way that you'll never forget the end of this movie no but but i really liked it i mean me too. I, I found the whole for uh, for an hour and twenty minutes. What else? What else are you gonna do for with your time? Like, it's a great way to spend the evening. I mean, this is one of the best undiscovered horror movies since Society, which we'll also get to at some point. Oh, great movie! Um, <laughs> like I, I, <clears throat> I was trying to think of a better movie with evil twins, and there is an evil easy one, Dead Ringers, mm. but. uh this has got to be high up there in the evil twin genre. <laughs> I'm trying to think of other evil twins. There's the other. Have you ever seen that? Uh, the other, no. Oh, that's a good one. But it's not our so scratch, scratch that. Fuck that. Um, <laughs> did you watch on the 
on the DVD, did you watch the uh, extra feature, which is the VHS credits of the movie? No, I skipped over that when I saw it. Oh, really? That seems like the kind of thing that you would watch. It was really interesting because the movie, as you can imagine, on VHS looks like absolute shit. And it like <laughs> it gives the movie such a different feel. Like it gives the, really? the movie like a dirty VHS feel that I wonder if I had seen this movie as a kid, I probably would have thought it was the most dangerous film out there. <laughs> Not since Faces of Death. Not since Faces of Death was banned in 39 countries has a film been so dangerous. <laughs> oh wait, also the hold on. I got the, there's one one funny thing about this movie is that so it had multiple titles including Slasher which is on the print of this Blu-ray and also Nightmare at Shadow Woods which it's just amazing. Was that the first title? Yeah, I think that's the first title. Wasn't it also called at one point Complex? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Complex was the first title. Okay. Then it's funny because they called it Nightmare at Shadow Woods because they were thinking of like cashing in on Nightmare on Elm Street as if anyone's just going to see Nightmare in the title and be like, oh, nice. I'm going to see this this movie as well. <laughs> Look, this has been our first episode, so it's kind of all over the place. But I just want to say I give my highest possible recommendation to Blood Rage, which I think is an amazing film and really should be a hugely cult movie. And it's kind of funny that we started with this movie because I think this is the pinnacle of what a company like Arrow can do. You know, they mm-hmm. released this movie that was totally had fallen into obscurity. They gave it cool art, not the best art, but cool ish. And, uh, but I mean, this is like a gift to the world and it's an amazing film. <laughs> I, I agree with everything you say. Um, next yeah. week, Rusty, it's your pick, which. We're not going to reveal to each other what our picks are until, um, you know, this moment in the show. On air, on air, on air. Uh, this is exciting. This is exciting stuff. It's like it's like the wedding reveal. Like when <laughs> the bride turns around, that's what we're doing. Uh, what bride? What? Like what? Like uh, for photos? Like when the bride turns around and reveals her gown to her husband. <laughs> you take the, you know, you, seriously never seen that before that just sounds really weird i don't know <laughs> when the bride turns around and reveals her dress to her wait that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense <laughs> edit, edit that out okay no let's hear okay. your choice let's hear it's your when choice. the groom turns around and opens his eyes and sees the dress <laughs> and opens that his would eyes make sense and sees the dress is this i, I went to a lot of weddings <laughs> i've been to a lot of weddings i don't know all right uh, uh what is your no, choice no, it's, well, it's for the photos. Hold on. Wait, you're editing this out. You got to take it from the top. No, I'm, the... I'm not taking it from the top because I actually like that moment. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right, I'll edit it out. Yeah. You're not going to edit it out. I know you. What is All your right. choice for the next week? Oh, you, you fucked me good on this one. <laughs> it's 3.22 in the morning. All right, so anyways, um, my pick for next week is a film that I saw many years ago and – I didn't process it then because I watched it late at night, but baby, comm- the, la- baby the last dinosaur. <laughs> I've seen that many times. And have you heard of vamp? <clears throat> Can I do that again? My voice yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a comedic horror film called vamp vamp starring, uh, Grace Jones. Wow. As a vampire. And, um, Everybody's favorite, uh, which <laughs> I forgot his name. Well, if it's Judge Reinhold, then yes. <laughs> if it's anyone else, no. <laughs> Everybody's favorite. It's 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 Christopher. Is his name Macpiece or Macpiece? Christopher Macpiece. All right, hold on. Let's try this again. Starring uh, Chris Macpiece. Macpiece. <laughs> Who is Chris? What's his name? You know, you never seen Meatballs? No, I've actually never seen. He's meatballs. in so many favorite films. He's in Meatballs, My Bodyguard, Mazes and Monsters, which oh, I know you love. I did recently put that on for about ten seconds. <laughs> even the <laughs> even the comedic stoned rewatch is not getting through that shit. <laughs> Tom Hanks is in it. Um, Crick, Ma- Chris Mac piece. Mac, uh, yeah, Mac piece. I guess. What else can you tell us about the film? Do you know anything else about it? Um, I, say I was younger when I saw it, not that young, but in my teens. And I just remember, because 
it, it's it's you know young guys going to a strip club. Oh, this is classic. So it's you. like from dusk till dawn kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Wait, so they go to the strip club and there's a vampire strip club. Um, from what I remember, if I'm setting this up, setting this up wrong, man, I feel bad, <laughs> but that's what I remember. No, that sounds cool. It's a good one. All right, so I guess we'll see everybody uh, next week with Vamp from Arrow Video. See ya. Who don't support this podcast in any way. (laughs) But they can and send more DVDs. See you next week. Okay, so... uh, (laughs) Let me say goodbye with dignity. So next week, (laughs) Vamp. Vamp. We're going to vamp it up. Oh, man. <laughs> I, need, I need sleep, man. Cool. It's only 325 in the morning. We're going to be vamping up with Vamp all next week. It's 100 degrees in this fucking room, and I left my car at my place. No way I'm taking the metro. Now I've got to endure a lift with a fucking stranger. Uh, Red thinks I'm a med, man. So, <laughs> He has become blood rage. I was, <laughs> I was anxious to end, and now I can't get off the air. <laughs> this whiff, man, I'm, I'm here. I'm, you're putting me to sleep. So, <laughs> the sounds of Eddie D. There's an airplane, and there's three parachutes <laughs> on this airplane. Shit. Ooh. All right. See you next week. <laughs>